to the live stream. Well, it's the third time, and we've got Clint Bollinger. Is he gonna meet Steve? That's the question. Oh, we're gonna talk about money too. Currency issuing monopolies. Be kind, stay safe, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the live stream. It is October 10th, 2023. We've got Clint Bollinger on the show today. We're going to talk about money and where it comes from, Uh, both government money, so fiat and um, bank credit. You know, how does it, you know, come about? It's an interesting topic Um, for people outside of economics. It can be quite, you know, fucking mind blowing. Um, to people within economics, half of them get it wrong. So it's it's going to be an interesting conversation we're going to have. We've got a full crew today. Dan's here. He's back from his protest last week of having an Austrian economist on the show. But he's he's willed his way back to come, come aboard. We've got Mike. He's somewhere in Massachusetts, close or far away from Boston. And we've got Steve Keen here. I'm going to bring on Daniel Sanderson first. Here he is. Now, Daniel looks rather frozen right now, or he's, he's, oh, he's gone. Wow, I bring on the person that glitches. I'll break, I'll try, fine, I'll try, I'll try Mike. Here he is, Mike Radzicki. I'm here. Oh, there we go. I love the technical issues always on the show. Mike, how you doing? Uh, d- doing well. Uh, sort of uh, coasting into the end of our first quarter next week with the, at the university. So that'll be grading and all that stuff I'll have to do. And today uh, it's raining like crazy here. So no uh, yard work, but I've got drywalling to do later today. So drywalling now you guys don't call it jip rocking down there Nah, i mean you can people would know what that means but it's typically called drywall okay i'm trying to think i think canadians say drywall i think or maybe it's the canadians that just you know say jip rock all the time i don't know um potato. yeah yeah for sure um you're back you missed a great episode last week it's too bad you you weren't here but um. yeah I, I had a carload of students uh we had to go out to a, a project venue we do these big projects with the students and i'm the advisor so we had to go out and do a project thing with undergraduates last saturday mm, I see. sorry let's, to have missed, but <clears throat> let's let's see what's going on in the chat here i'm already in trouble <laughs> mike radzicki do I not really say that correctly, Mike? Am no, I saying it too, too no, correctly? Red, red Zicky's fine. That's good. Red, yeah. It's fine, but is it correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's, let's bring no, on Dan. No teacher ever got it right on the first day of class. So. <laughs> Here he is. I'll try it there again. There we go. Okay. D- yeah. Daniel Sanderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel, I brought you on first, but you were just kind of a frozen statue there for a second. Yeah, it's my testament to ancient Greece. You know, I figured, um, you know, I'm just definitely not an epitome of a, of a human being. You know, how would you imagine some of these statues in Greece with a bucket hat? I just, uh, you know, I just don't think it would fly. Oh, well, you never know. Uh, 2,000 years from now, there could be a big statue of a man with a fairly good beard and a bucket hat um, somewhere, yeah. you know, yeah. in the, the ruins of human civilization by that point, I guess, with global yeah. warming and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. Uh, we'll bring on the man, Professor Steve Keen. Here he is. Hi, all. Thank you. 
you know, eating grapes here, in case you're wondering what my chewing at the moment. Grapes for dinner. <clears throat> grapes for dinner. Steve, how are you doing? Uh, pretty well. It's just um, pulling my hair out, I must say, with a Minsky model. I can't quite work out what I've done wrong and putting it together. So um, uh, not, not as good as I'd like to be, but hopefully I'll fix it up tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll probably tell you it's either you've got a zero in one of your your division equations and you got a zero error, or you've put the wrong operator somewhere. I've actually, I did that for a while, but I think I've actually got a. I've just got to go through and check the logic. I'm deriving it from first principles, so I may have made a an error in tacking on a model rather than doing it properly from first principles. Mm -hmm. it, I'll, I'll find out tomorrow. I'll be doing a bit of algebra tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found because Minsky, we don't really have a lot of analyzing tools yet. I save, mm. you know, a lot of different versions along the way, and then I can kind of backtrack yeah. and see, you know, where the error occurred and then fix it in the more recent version. Mm. Um, so this is great. We've, we are actually here now. You're going to actually interact with Clint. We've had Clint for about four hours already, um, just kind of practicing right. um, you two interacting. <laughs> so... Third time's the charm, and it worked out. So here he is, Clint Bollinger, back on the show. Hello. Hi, Clint. Yeah, Hello, Steve. Really good to see you. And Indeed, Clint, yeah. I'm sorry I missed the last couple of times. Clint is the author right. of Thousand Castaways, Fundamentals of Economics. Make sure you pick up a copy of that book. Clint, how you doing, buddy? All right, I came all the way to Australia to see Steve, and he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> I, know I was just telling. I wonder we'd love to go back there. <laughs> for the audience, I'm in yeah. Tasmania at the moment, so it's uh, after three in the morning. Been here about a week and a half, so checking it out down here. I was surprised. I knew it'd be cold, but I didn't realize it'd be this cold. What's the temperature? Um, let's see. I haven't really. I usually do Celsius when I travel, but I've been looking at Fahrenheit just because I was just in the States mm. right before I got here. Um, so it's been in the 50s mainly, Fahrenheit. So I guess in the low teens, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. low teens, tens, yeah. I was ready for some cold weather, though. I was working over the summer in Costa Rica, actually, on the Caribbean side, which is really hot and humid. And then I got back to Dallas, yeah. and it was uh, about 43, 44 degrees Celsius every day. Really hot September um, which has actually been making headlines all around the world and um, not just Texas, but I mean in general. And then, um, yeah, so I thought Tassie would be, it's going to be nice to have some cool weather. I'm having a perpetual <laughs> spring. The leaves are just budding you over, out you, over, you overdid it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was talking to somebody, uh, a local the other day and I was like, well, you know, when's it going to kind of start, you know, getting spring like weather. And she said, February. <laughs> So, well, maybe January. <laughs> I, my, 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 my first wife and I went down to Tasmania for a holiday at one stage because her sort of surrogate mum was a, was a Tasmanian. And we decided that uh, uh, summer in uh, Tasmania is December 28th. I believe it. I That's believe it. it, yeah. One day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one we, day. It, we're, actually, we're, we're actually there on New Year's Eve, I think it was. And we were so New Year's Eve in Sydney. For those who don't know, is normally about 30, 35 degrees Celsius, so close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but oh, there we yeah. were in Tasmania, same time of year, and we were sort of fighting with other couples to try to get closer to the open fire. Well, that's crazy. Was yeah, I was in, uh, yeah. in Hobart. I managed to get into the city museum, and it's um, our, I guess, state museum. And uh, really nice, but had a big section on Antarctic expo exploration, all the base out of here mm. and everything. And uh, yeah, definitely put me in a cold weather kind of mood. It showed all the clothes they wore like 100 years ago. And I visited mm. the uh, Mawson huts. So Mawson is one of the Australian. Oh, right. uh, yeah, yeah. yeah some really, really interesting stuff. But looking at the mm. gear they had in about 1915, 1920, it's hard to believe that they could uh, do the things they did back then. Yeah, with that, that equipment. Yeah, talk about yeah. stoic. We're, we're, wimp, we're wimp by comparison these days. Definitely, without a doubt. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I was looking, they had little packets of like the food they had and medicines. It was really interesting. Um, I always think about geography is my real thing, so international trade and all. And there were uh, the meat substance they had for exploring was uh, from Chicago 
Um, something else they had was from Hoboken, New Jersey, and they had all the little, you know, kind of late Victorian age looking packets of stuff. And a lot of it was from the U S actually. Uh, uh. <clears throat> okay. So we've already got a very important uh, cr- a question from Michael. Um, I don't know why he's asking me. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, which version of football do I follow? Tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. raised on rugby league. I was raised on rugby league, and like back in, the, the, I, I wish I could get back to that. I, I was in when I was in my t- twenty-seven years old. I still weighed fifty-five kilos. So at school, I weighed about below fifty, so, you know, less than one hundred and ten pounds. And I was lightning fast and very manoeuvrable. But uh, the big, big blokes on the other side of the team enjoyed trying to crush me. So as soon as I could get out of football, I got into uh, long distance running, which suited mm-hmm. me fine, of course. And I was playing tennis from the age of nine. And uh, I went to my last football match, I think, when I was about 15 or 16. And then I was sort of cheering. And I thought, I'm cheering for this shit. It's boring. <laughs> and I've never been since. So um, any any soccer I'll play is going to be uh, – tennis football would be, would be soccer, which I regard as a skillful game. Rugby league is two bunches of morons trying to smash each other to shit. Um, I know the feeling. I, no. uh, I got roped into two seasons. I lived in England for a while of rugby yeah. didn't know what i was doing and they needed yeah. a 15 basically and uh they had some real good players on the other teams and definitely got killed quite a few times but it was a good experience yeah i think i'll tell I you think that, NFL is really interesting i was reading up on the history of uh how all the different games split you know american football and yeah. canadian and soccer and all and afl is actually considered the oldest organized of all of them uh, australian rules football they had some of the earliest I think organized that, that, games that's a skill. That's a skillful game. If you've had, if had to watch any Australian football, it would be Australian rules, because of the, somebody saying there are genetic freaks. You get the most elegant bodies uh, of mm. Aussie rules play. If you had to, had to sort of measure them on a sort of Greek standard, and they're using, uh, by the way, Ty Canes and Ty Canes. Which Ty Canes is in Greece right now? <laughs> Dan, you've been mislabeled. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. uh, okay, but uh, if you had to judge uh, football codes on the basis of the bodies. Aussie rules is a mile ahead of any of the others. You get Greek gods uh, coming out of it. They're quite spectacular physics, and it reflects the the skills involved. The game which involves huge jumps and then very yeah. fast running as well. So, as the for big, sporting, the big guy here right now is a guy from Dallas on the AFL for I think Colleen. Okay. Whatever the team in Melbourne is, Collingwood, Colleen. Colling, Collingwood, Collingwood. Yeah. yeah, I think that's who he's with. Um, but he's a. Uh, Big deal here. He somehow ended up in Australia, and he's uh, it's like six eleven or something ridiculous, which is really so, too tall even for AFL. But apparently, he's really good. Yeah, yeah. So, so tying this conversation to economics, Jeff Harcourt <laughs> told me years ago that he played uh, rugby. I'm not sure which of the versions of it un- into his seventies. Aussie rules. He played Aussie rules. Aussie rules. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's better he's than tough, me. I can't run guy. those. Tough guy. He was indeed. He was indeed. Yeah. So um, let's uh, remind everybody, Clint, how did you become aware of Steve Keen's work? I know we've discussed it on the previous two shows, yeah, yeah, but he's here now. That. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, Steve, let's uh, talk you, about that. Professor Keen, I've always wanted to meet you or talk to you. You, um, you were I was always interested. I knew something was going on. You know, I grew up kind of in the 90s, uh, all the U.S. headlines back then, <clears throat> or about the debt. That was a, a big deal back then as well. And um, I just kind of had a feeling something didn't make sense with that. So, I, but you know, this was kind of pre-internet days, and I was you know digging and digging and digging. I finally ended up with uh, Irving Fisher's work, which oh, yeah. you know has some good work, uh, 100% Money, and some of these books he had and articles. And um, then I kind of forgot about it, but I was always interested. I was actually my undergraduate was archaeology, um, but I kind of had a global perspective. I was focused on Mesopotamia and uh, kind of um, kind of the roots of civilization and how different. Uh, technologies and cultures impacted long-term development and um but i was always interested in the kind of economic side and i ended up doing kind of an economic geography as my doctorate um but at some point around 2011 i was actually traveling it was um i ran across debt deflation and it just blew my mind i kind of you know i'd been interested in that theme but no one had ever explained it that well so obviously mm-hmm. after 2008 it was back in the news a lot and uh that's when one whole big side of that clicked so that's you're definitely one of the main people who got me more interested in actual economics proper 
you know, because it's the first time I'd heard anyone speak very logically about it. You know, <laughs> you can read neoclassical yeah. stuff all day long and you just end up more confused. Oh. Yeah, I mean, those buggers try to squeeze everything into an equilibrium framework, including Fisher. So, like, Bernanke claimed to have read Fisher, uh, but what he said was uh, that uh, it talked about how, think about nominal debtors and and didn't even realise that, that Fisher began from a disequilibrium foundation. He literally said, um, uh, it is as is, 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 is ridiculous to assume that an economy can ever be in equilibrium as it is to assume that the Atlantic Ocean can be without a wave. So his fundamental starting point was disequilibrium. And of course, that completely passed Bernanke by. So we tried to give an explanation using equilibrium thinking. And that's, you know, it's like trying to explain the orbits of uh, the trajectory to get to Mars using Ptolemaic epicycles. It's just nonsense. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Irving Fisher definitely, I think it's, uh, I mean, he gets attention, but, you know, he was obviously for his time. And all that whole yeah. group, Frank Knight, that whole group of 1920s yeah. scholars was really, they hadn't been ruined yet by neoclassical. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, what totally. I what I find fa fascinating is that Fisher was actually the archetypical neoclassical. He was the, the leading mathematical economist in America. His PhD thesis, which he wrote, and I think he published in two, 1907, uh, was a, a an equilibrium analysis of finance and it basically everything goes to supply and demand so he managed to try to fit it in the supply and demand but the problem was of course um the supply in finance uh is paid back over over time it's not something you you know it's not like buying an apple buy the apple eat the apple this is you know take out the loan paid back over 25 years so to make the whole thing work he had to assume that all debts are repaid nobody defaults and that markets were in equilibrium at all points in time. And he, he swallowed his own bullshit. So he took out, he had about $10 million of profits that he'd made, I think, out of uh, producing Rolodex and selling that to the Rand Corporation. Ended up on the board of, uh, of, of, the, Rand Corp, of the Rand Corporation. Took out margin loans, leave it up to a $100 million position and lost it all in one day, which is, of course, the Great yeah. Crash of 1929. And then that just completely, I mean, it was, imagine how devastating that was. It was literally worth in 2000 terms dollars, a hundred million. And then suddenly bang, he's a pauper. And the only reason he avoided bankruptcy was that his wife's sister was wealthy in her own right and lent him the money to avoid bankruptcy. And then when she died, she forgave his debts to her on her deathbed. Otherwise he would have been penniless. And the only reason he had a house was Columbia University gave him somewhere to live. So the shock was just incredible. And because of that, over time, he's slowly realized what got him, led him wrong was believing in equilibrium. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through the 30s, I know he's writing some really, really good work. Mm. It's interesting because yeah. his work and um, Frank Knight and um, I actually wrote a blog post somewhere a long time ago. Uh, Frederick Soddy was actually more of an influence on them than people realized. I looked in some archival. Okay. Yeah. They were talking about Saudi's work in the 20s, before 29, um, which mm -hmm. I also thought was interesting, given Saudi's um, relationship to ecological economics as well, you know, way before his time in that whole whole area. But, yeah, so that was the whole the whole banking side. But I knew I was – I didn't know. I, I could feel I was missing something. And where it really hit the, the other half of the equation was I was reading a uh, John T. Harvey article in Forbes – about the same time, maybe with a year after, mm -hmm. and uh, it was his. He's one of his really good Forbes articles on Social Security. It's uh, titled "Social yeah. Security Can Never Go Bankrupt," and he just sets up the basic uh, idea of you know like ten people. I don't think he's an island, but like if there's only ten people in the world, basically, and like you know if one person wasn't working, then you've got nine people. They're just going to give the tenth person. He has them fishing. They're they're going to give the tenth person a fish. In other words, he's yeah. bringing it all back to real resources. And however yeah. you do the finance between that doesn't matter in a way. The simplest is the best because at the end of the day, uh -huh. you're just giving that guy a fish. Um, until he was explaining this with Social Security, it makes no difference. Uh, you know, all the um, superannuation schemes and all this and that and the other, it's nonsense. It's, it's and at the end of the day, we either give retirees or people that in need something or we don't. <laughs> and it's the same cost no matter what. Actually, it's less efficient if we have all this mumbo jumbo between anyways and um that's when it clicked the uh what in you know some people call the vertical side or the government side of the 
and that, when I put your work together, John T. Harvey isn't specifically MMT always, but that got me into the MMT side of it. And, mm. but, you know, you can, mm. that's um, in my book, that's what I focus on is just trying to explain to the general public um, the idea of like, we have two systems that are completely linked by the unit of account, but one is government spending and the other is the banking system, endogenous money, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, they have different purposes and, but you're uh, you are definitely one of the one of the ones, the first one that really influenced me. So, Good, thank so you. Mm. you kind of bring up kind of the topic of you know money creation. The title of this um, episode, and you kind of hit on both. We've got you know bank credit and fiat money. Can you explain um, exactly how government uh, spending creates money and how? banks um, create money uh, through its process. Can you kind of give us a rundown on that? And then we'll ask Dan. No, Dan, let's actually, because Dan's got to go in 30 or less than 30 minutes. Dan, how is money created? Oh, he's frozen again. <laughs> oh, dear. He's, he's keeping <laughs> thought. <laughs> timing. <laughs> Look at it's that created by turning, <laughs> You turn into a statue and then you get some of Medusa's hair and then you distribute Medusa's hair. I was going to, you know, this this was supposed to be a little segue because I know Dan's not exactly the most economically literate. And then Clint could come in and say, hey, no, this is how it works. So we'll just go directly to Clint. Explain that process to the viewers. Well, I'd say certainly modern money and using that Keynes kind of idea of from Sumeria on is modern money, you might say, or has been much of the time and is now completely um, starts with the imposition of the liability. So that's certainly the charterless view in the simplest way. So we impose a tax on ourselves. We impose a liability on ourselves. And then whatever unit we allow ourselves to, to satisfy that liability, that's the monetary unit. And then for obvious reasons, um, the banking system, certainly once again in modern centralized bureaucracies, bureaucratic states is going to use that unit to extend credit. And that's your banking system or, or the, not the payment system, but the, credit side of the banking system. And so that's why I, uh, what Mosler's term is with vertical. And I know Basil Moore used it slightly differently, but um, your vertical and horizontal is basically the vertical is the tax credit. And so it starts with the liability. It's just a way to move resources from the private to the public sphere for group projects. When I say group, I mean the nation. And then the banking system uses that same unit of account and extends credit in, in that unit of account. So that's how they're linked. And to the public, it's invisible. A dollar is a dollar, it seems to us, but there's really kind of two really different sources and uses for the dollar or, or the pound or any currency of any country. Daniel, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, I don't know what all that freezing was all about, but um, you were in right deep in thought. Par. Yeah, well, it makes sense with the statue comment and uh, maybe a little bit of constipation. <laughs> that was funny. I got it. <laughs> but, so I, what I really want to tee up is that um, uh, we didn't really have um, Steve in our last session with Clint to defend or fill out um, your perspective on, on barter. And so I'd yeah. like to talk about barter and... Um, and and Steve's perspective on barter, which I I think that was there's there's a bit of um, a misunderstanding about the origins going back to Mesopotamia or how you know the historic origins of of of, of money emerged. So I'd like to, I'd like to go there. Maybe tell us what your thoughts are on barter and let Steve come in and and comment. My thoughts are Steve's. Well, yours uh, first, Clint. Um, well, I think there's. There's a lot of misunderstanding. I totally get uh, the, the, the idea. So the problem is in modern neoclassical economics, they don't have money at all. So they can't model money or finance or anything because they just they model it as a strictly, you could say a pure barter, whatever. There's, there's just no money. Things are just exchanged. And this really, to me, comes mainly from the marginalist kind of revolution with Menger and Jevons and followers, um, where to, to make their models tractable, they did this. Um, I don't really think that has to do with the so-called myth of barter, but I totally get why you would want to say um, the barter story, the way people kind of think about it is wrong. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. I think it's more complex than that in a way. 
Uh, what I was saying last time was that when you really think about it, the, the barter story is precisely says that there's not going to be bartering in a complex society. So in that sense, it's right. So the, the, the barter story says in a, you know, extremely basic, some kind of primitive to, to use that word society, mm -hmm. um, maybe, or maybe not, you know, they would trade goods or whatever, but that's not what modern societies or even, even any kind of society thousands of years ago did. Um, but that's what the barter story says. It says that you won't have barter. You'll have a commodity unit. Um, it could be a pure tax credit, but that takes a lot of bureaucratic kind of development that took a long time. And so it, it's just more complicated. And I also, I pointed out last time, I think that really some of the first people talking about this was pre-social science people, um, Adam Smith and, you know, various other writers, um, Locke or all the different, you know, they didn't really have any true archaeology. They didn't have a real accurate uh, understanding of the time frame of human development. So we're talking over tens of thousands of years, we're talking 20, 30,000 years ago, whatever. At some point there was um, nothing like what you would could, even what we had in ancient Sumeria. So at that point you had, you know, obviously at some point somebody said, Hey, I'll give you that. If you give me this, that surely happened. Right. Um, and then you have this very, very slow development of commodity units and you had to have a unit first, because as I, I pointed out in a blog post before, you can't have a formal liability without a formal asset. It's impossible. So like, you can't have any kind of structured credit relation, even if it's informal, without saying, okay, you owe me 10 of these. Well, 10 what? So you And the way that developed before in the very earliest writing would have been with units of account that are actual commodities. So the most common was grain. Salt was quite common in Asia and other areas, but barley was in Mesopotamia certainly the key grains in general. And then, um, so it's just, it's a more complicated, longer story is that, that I totally understand why when we want to show how bad neoclassical economics are, that we point out that the whole way they think of a barter economy is wrong. But the, the, the true way all this developed is a longer, more complex story that I think we should get right. But I really don't think it matters. I mean, we live in a modern monetary world. Sorry, that was long. I'll mm -hmm. let <laughs> Yeah, Steve. Well, I, um, I, I, my uh, perspective comes out of knowing the work of uh, people like Michael Hudson and Cornelia Wunsch and so who were the ones of the archaeology um, of Mesopotamia and so on. But if you also look at what a lot of archaeologists have found, um, and this is also often studying modern tribes, uh, where there are some hunter-gatherer tribes and so on, there's no such thing as a, a person owning a animal when you have a collective hunt to bring them back and uh, what you find is exchange and and uh, allocation of goods is very customary and there's interest at the same time as smith was writing about uh, uh humans having a propensity to truck and barter we were getting the earliest um anthropological studies of the iroquois marx wrote about this and what they found is the iroquois allocated uh goods from what's called a women's council the women would decide who got what and there was no way it was anything involving barter or um, uh, in, any uh, capacity of of um, the capacity of an individual to regard a commodity as alien to themselves and therefore uh, alienable as Marx put it um, so you didn't have ownership in that sense so you, if you don't have ownership you can't have barter uh, right this Marx, was Marx Graeber yeah, yeah, uh, Graham and Mark, uh, David's work was very largely based on Michael, Michael Hudson's and Cornelia Wunsch's research. Right. So um, the thing with, but, with yeah. I mean, you did have this. You know, I, I actually I I wrote down what he'd written. You know, you have group production, group identity, kinship, redistribution, gifts, fears of exchange, reciprocity, and all these other non-market things for sure. Yeah. But. Um, he bases his work out of Polanyi and, and some others, and they themselves recognize that when you're not the, so the, the seeds of the exchange where you would get units of account would be between outgroups. So when you did have people who weren't in the same tribe or same kinship yeah. group or whatever trying to exchange, and that's the seeds of it. And it was much smaller, but that's the seeds of what became later the accounting of units of account. Marx argues that as well in the volume one of Capital, that it was 
trade between civilization, between societies, which had elements of barter to it. But David's David Graeber's work goes farther and said that he even uh, it, 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 once the tribe were, you know, had a sort of permanent boundary, as permanent as human boundaries are, uh, they themselves would have customary exchange. Uh, so it was only the sort of an initial confrontation or it was tribes which were quite warlike. And David gives a couple of examples where barter was actually used in a ritual fashion to defuse potential um, uh, military conflict between tribes. So somebody asked, why does it matter? And the reason it does matter is that this is a creation myth of economics. And they've got a creation myth which is wrong and everything is built on top of that as well. And, you know, we get, if, you get the, if you get the information right, throw the creation myth out the window. It is yet another neoclassical myth. It just gets in the bloody way. And you know, we, we are we're now in a modern monetary system which bears no relation to the myth of barter either. Uh, but of course, neoclassical, the neoclassical concept of exchange is based on the myth of barter. You have the idea of relative prices, two commodities to exchange, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it is just nonsense to regard that as being based uh, based on barter, the, the modern system being based on barter. It, again, it's a credit-based system, and if you want to find its origins, it comes out of early human, early Cro-Magnon societies and the concept of mutual trust. And trust fundamentally is what we mean by credit. Yeah, that's that's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And then, of course, ancient taxation, and then ever ever more organized with time. You get the functioning tax credit systems. I do think it's interesting. The early tax credit systems were both a commodity and a tax. I mean, they were taxing in kind for grain. Yeah, yeah, and I like the fact so that most of the original debts were 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 incurred in ale halls. So I'm sorry, our bankers began as al a lot of our original debts were incurred in ale halls. So uh, people would get drunk, and uh, and so in fact the source of banks were alcohol were were uh, alcohol distributors, which is pretty apt when you think about it. Nice, nice. Yeah. My it kind always of world. Beer. It always comes back to beer. Make sure yeah, you hit yeah, that yeah. hit that like button on YouTube. Subscribe at Prof Steve Keen. If you're over on Twitter now, known as X, make sure you hit the like button there. Repost. Come over here. Join the chat. I'm gonna get Mike into this, but he's got the duties this week. So, uh, Mike, it's gonna be top chatters, top commenters from last week. You weren't here, but you know the okay. names are, are are prepared for you to read. Mm -hmm. It's your turn. Here we go. Okay, uh, Lars Jovian R, AGV Random six four seven Wayne McMillan the Libertarian Brad Atherton the Atheist Paladin Oy vey Alex Plant JBO eight eight Peter McGillivray J Daglish Ghost on a Half Shell Tony Wilson TR Data Lord de la Terra, WWE Fan 0104, Stephen Hinton, Teddy Bruschi, Jens Runberg, Bob Liori, Andrew Sullivan, Tomas Sherdez, Sherday? Oh, that's when I always blow. Um, Wadagashu, <laughs> Michael D'Souza Cruz, Mano Haran, Algorithm, Apple Scab, Bobby Valentine, Drigai, BMC, Shashir Pandey, Philippe Burns, uh, show this one again, Sigui's Rex, Paul Luther Blissett, Olivia Langara, Langarica, Douglas, MMT Macro Trader, The Minstrel 55, Andrew Sullivan, and Jaka Vanadu. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's more of them now. The list is getting longer. Yeah. I might, I might actually put a word. I'm going to put in a word for libertarian here. Who put a comment on the YouTube after that he's not actually a libertarian. He began mm -hmm. as one, and he became a uh, move away from the Austrian towards post Keynesian perspective. So uh, libertarian is not a libertarian. There you go. Yeah, actually, so there's a lot of uh, examples. You know, Douglas, the MMT macro trader, very much a, a libertarian mindset, bit of a gold bug back in the day, pre 2008. Steve Grumbine, another kind of situation there. Even myself, I, I watched, you know, I was the zeitgeist and I was definitely had a more, I wouldn't say libertarian, but uh, closer to that end of the spectrum. And 
I think so dominant in uh, early internet think days. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there, on, uh, on it's, the it, it it elicits <laughs> kind of a bit of the conspiracy stuff. Um, I th- so it kind of draws you in, but also I think uh, although you know we know there's Austrians out there that take the libertarian mindset um, pretty far. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, it's it's kind of like a growing stage. You, you know, you grow from being very individualistic, is that a word, um, to a more mature individual where you, you care about your family around you. And just by extension, that that's going to push you, I think, into the other spectrum, a uh, spectrum closer to post-Keynesians and MMT and et cetera. Uh, Mike, I want to kind of just get your opinion on barter, um, uh, you know what came first, the origin theories. Just a brief, your brief thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, so I was uh, all ears listening to this. Uh, there are some authors, Matt Forstatter at UMKC comes to mind, but there are certainly others who write about the origin of money and the origin of chartalism and what have you. And you know they talk about tally sticks and bones with. Uh, um, the gashes on them, uh, where there's some kind of scoring system going on, record keeping, you know, so in some sense, money is is record keeping, of course, assets and liabilities, as, as Clint kind of a, a alluded to. Uh, the MMT people like to say, and I think they're right, you know, a modern monetary theory is in some sense misnamed. It's not modern. It goes back a long way. And a lot of it is not theory. It's a mechanical description of how a fiat currency system works. And that's actually what got me interested some 20 years ago in this whole area. Because when I first heard about it, I was like, that's not what I was taught. That sounds like a little out there. But when I looked into it, I was like, well, most of it is just mechanically describing, as I would do if I was building a model, a system dynamics model, what happens in a fiat currency, it's hard to dispute it. It's like, you know, if you could talk to a banker or a central bank, whatever, this is mechanically what happens. That's most of it. There is some subjective stuff. You know, Warren Moser will always say, you know, there's a political discussion about however it is, whatever political system there is about the size of the public sector. You know, do you want to pay a private company to pick up your garbage or should the, the government do it? Do you, is the court system big enough? Or do you need more judges and courthouses and, you know, and so so on and so forth. And then that's decided somehow. And then the, um, the, the whatever the public sector size is, that amount of resources have to, has to be moved through to, from the private sector and that you impose a tax and the whole story starts from there. So um, I think, I think that, that would, that's my, been my argument when I've been talking to um other economists who think it's a bunch of nonsense, I say, let's talk about mechanically what happens here. You tell me when you do, when we got something wrong here. And they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like, it's hard to disagree when, when you're just outlining the institutions and how they mechanically operate. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what, kind of my, my overall, you know, overview of- Yeah, like I, I began with the credit money perspective, of course, that's where my modeling of Minsky came from and debt deflation and so on. And I didn't actually work on, I had government, I'm actually, but that's making me pull my hair out right now. I'm working on a, a stylized model of a government sector added to a pure credit economy. And I'm not getting, I'm making some errors, obviously, in the way I've laid out the logic. So I've got to fix that up. Um, but so I did have a government model in my model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis back in 1995. Um, but I didn't actually formally start modeling money until I invented Minsky. And then... <clears throat> Uh, when I, I became on board with MMT, in terms of its monetary side, it was literally, it was just the mechanics of how it all happens. Because if I uh, lay out what the, the private sector does, um, you have a, the bank increases its assets by creating a loan, and it must also increase its liabilities by adding to a deposit. That's a given. So its assets and liabilities go up, and then you get to the private sector it's the other way around. What is an asset for the bank is a liability and vice versa. So it's asset to liability, liability to asset. And that's a, there are four elements. I'm putting my hand right here. Four elements in that particular picture. Then when I modeled the, um, the see you, Dan. Then, then when I modeled the uh, government. Dan, Dan every, every, yeah, sorry. Dan, Dan yeah, thanks Dan. for dro- dropping in, buddy. 
Yeah. Right, we'll see, see you guys we'll, next week. We, we'll see you next week. Bye, buddy. No see you, Clint. Yeah. So to bring in see the government next. sector, the government increases um, Hi, the assets of, of the banking sector and increases the liabilities as well by running it, uh, having a spending more than a take back on taxation. It increases deposits. That also increases reserves. Uh, but then when you get to the central, so that's an asset liability pair. The same thing applies at the level of the reserves, but that's a liability to liability pair, okay? Because the treasury's liability, when the treasury runs a deficit, its, its asset of the central bank, which is the central bank's liability goes down, the reserves, which are the other liability go up, okay? Then when you look at the treasury, the treasury has a lib has a, liability that goes, uh, an asset that goes down, which is the same as liability going up. And the only matching entry that is, is equity has to go negative. When you look at the private sector, the same thing applies there. The private sector's effect of government's deficit spending is for its equity to rise. And so you get eight, there are eight, you know, count them, eight, whoops, eight entries you need to make to get the government money creation, whereas only four for the private sector. And it's equity and li an equity and a, a, a liability uh, change at the government level, and an equity and an asset change at the private sector level. Yeah, real quick, uh, the the way I got involved um, with with MMT was I read a paper by Randy Ray and Stephanie uh, well Bell at the time I think it was Stephanie Kelton. Mm. I'm sure you've heard of both of them, and in the paper they lament the fact that modern monetary theory is hard for people to grasp because they teach it with T accounts. And no, they said they make a statement about something like nobody understands T accounts anymore except accountants. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to Randy and I said, I all the assets and liabilities in your T accounts, they're called stocks in my system dynamics package. Oh, and I can yeah. model that, you know, and the dynamics of it. And that's when he invited me out to, to Kansas City. And I think, oh. uh, I think Steve's innovation with the Minsky software package is to take what I just said and make it very easy to do, almost automatic, yeah. in in with with godly tables. Yeah, and that disciplines the thinking. Again, if you want to get the mechanical stuff right, you got to be disciplined. Right? And I think the godly tables allow that. Yeah, thanks, Matt. That's exactly why I invented it, and I'm delighted it works as well as it does. And if you, when you look at it, there's no contest. The government creates money by running up negative equity for itself, which become positive equity for the private sector. And that's another way of putting across the MMT argument about no net money, no net uh, asset creation out of private lending, but net asset creation for the private sector out of government spending. Silence. Clint, we're talking over the top of you here. You should dive in. So, so oh, no. uh, yeah, Clint, Clint um, I was kind of just looking at the chat. You brought up bonds. And I don't know. Did I miss something there? What What were you? Referring no, I was to? just um. It's it's more, more of the uh, government side of the equation that's been in the news a lot. You know, they've been talking about a bond meltdown and all. And uh, I think this also. I think there's a good way to tie this into complexity as well. I think that's the big problem with bonds. Actually, the fact that we not only does interest rate um, manipulation not do what uh, the mainstream thinks it does. Um, or certainly not in a in a useful way. In other words, a non harmful way, but also just the extra layer of complexity when you're talking about how difficult it is to model. Um, you just add this massive new level of complexity, and it's amazing when you read all the discussions. How even people within the same kind of school of thought, so whether neoclassicals talking among themselves or any group um, subgroup, they none of them agree on anything. It's just too complex. <laughs> And I was just wondering, I thought uh, I'd like to hear uh, Professor Keen on anything about bonds <laughs> lately. Steve, Steve, What's anything again? about bonds? Well, this is where I had a, um, we, we went, when I put together Stephanie's logic from the deficit myth, it turned out that bonds were purchased using the funds created by the deficit, which we call reserves. Ty, you call them settlement balances, which is like is much more realistic. We should try to work across to um, using that term rather than reserves. Um, but when the government runs a deficit, the balancing asset on the bank's books is the settlement accounts. And of course, 
settlement accounts either earn no interest or less interest than bonds. So when the government then issues bonds, they are purchased using the settlement accounts. And as you argued, Ty, and I posted, it caused you a bit of grief with the MMT people, but you were 100% correct in the mechanics of it all. If there aren't sufficient settlement reserves, uh, assets in the bank, possession of the banks at the time, given historical circumstances, then someone at the central bank buys bonds off the private banks, which creates the settlement accounts with which they buy the new bonds. And so that that logic uh, is incontrovertible. To me, to me, the danger, uh, which we're seeing just now with the increase in interest rates, is that um, the because like settlement accounts always have the same value because it's you know it's basically it's it's a, it, it's not a money but it's an at call asset whereas bonds of course have terms associated with them and the longer the duration of the bond the more volatile that value is to the rate of interest and for the, ever since Vokla that's been a winning game for the banks because they buy the bonds interest rates fall the bonds are worth more but when the central bank started putting rates up I don't really think they understood the dynamics that that, unless they're consuls, which is what I tend to model them as. But if you model them as consuls, there's even worse. The volatility is exactly inverse to the rate of interest. Um, so if you have 30-year 30 30 bonds, they're more volatile than five-year bonds, which are more volatile than six-month bonds and so on. Um, so when the reserve started putting up the rates on bonds, it started reducing the value of the long-term bonds held by the banking sector. And the only way they avoided bankruptcy out of it uh, was by not marking them to market to have what they call a uh, hold to what do they call them? a hold to, hold to settlement or hold to maturity and only because they said a hold to maturity they they didn't have to reckon with the reduction in value uh, due to the interest rate change because they just hold to maturity they're always going to be of that value now that's a myth of course because if if their depositors said we don't like what your bank looks like right now which is what happens to Silicon Valley Bank of course um, then depositors could turn up and say, we've got a, a billion dollars of withdrawals we want to make. You've only got five million worth of reserves. You better sell some of those bonds, including the ones you've got marked down as a hold to market, and bang, banks go bankrupt. So we're in a very, very fragile point right now because fundamentally the Federal Reserve doesn't understand bonds. Yeah, they're right. just term deposits, um, really. Transferable savings accounts, as Mosler calls them. Yeah, yeah but, they, but their value is their value is dependent upon the current rate of interest, which makes them that's that's the volatility issue. And like Silicon Valley Bank had lots and lots of thirty-year bonds, which has actually been quite conservative in its portfolio. It didn't have many private loans. It really was a deposit. It was an assistant to enable uh, private entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley to do exchange with each other. It really was the sort of almost one hundred percent reserves in that sense. Only the reserves were bonds. And that's why they were so badly hit when the rates went up. Their asset side collapsed. It's, it seems to me, too, that some blame could be laid at the feet of, I think, in the United States, it's the comptroller of the currency that's in charge of stress testing banks and making sure that they are not in the sort of position that Steve has outlined, where, you know, you're right on the precipice of something really bad happening, right? That's... Presumably, the banking system is highly regulated, and the regulators need to make sure that you, the system is robust, right? And you don't get the uh, positive feedback loops unwinding everything rather abruptly, usually, right? And you get a financial crisis. So maybe it's the regulators who need to study. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, the re regulators have got, had, had the frontal lobotomy by studying in their classical economics. <laughs> Uh, Clint, um, Michael, Michael wants you to tell everybody about Scott uh, Fullwheeler's paper um, and Peter Cooper's blogs about the actual spending process. Oh, yeah, that's a great. I, I imagine you're familiar with this. Uh, Peter Cooper, another Australian, I believe, actually. Um, he's just got a great uh, couple of papers that, you know, lay it all out in tables that show that basically, you, you know, it's always spending is equal to your taxes plus savings. In other words, it works out no matter what you do for a currency issuer. The government credits accounts, what it doesn't tax back is savings. And that's when I talk about bonds at the most basic level, we should just get rid of them and just call them term deposits with the Fed if yeah. if you wanted to pay interest or just savings. 
that's all it is. And uh, yeah. he's got a great uh, thing where he can kind of work through it because it's, as you know, with double account, uh, double entry accounting, it gets tricky once you have even three entities involved. Um, but yeah, that's where I, I get into the. Or I'm interested in the idea of complexity. Is it? It's literally nobody understands what's going on. I mean, literally, just read the finance press. Nobody knows. <laughs> You know, not only do they have a bad theory to start with, but even if you have a good theory, once you have interest rates, you know, with all these different maturities and all this going on, you can never really predict the the system, what's going to happen. And there's just no need for it. And I, I believe it's vestigial. I always point this out from the days before states were uh, sovereign, they were genuinely borrowing money from the big Italian banks or else uh, literally taking out loans based on gold coins or whatever back in the 1500s, hmm. 1600s. And we've, we're stuck with this system of sovereign bonds that we think they're necessary when they're no longer necessary and haven't been for a long time. I agree. I agree. I mean, as you say, if, if it was simply a case of the banks being allowed to transfer money from reserves to a term deposit, uh, which paid interest, that would be exactly the same effect as the bonds now without the danger that the value of the term deposit could be reduced by changing the interest rate. You'd simply get paid a higher interest rate. And if for any reason we thought it was necessary or useful to have 30 year, no, you know, it'd be term yeah. deposits for 30 years, but it would be more transparent. Yeah. The key thing is it and would the, be an it, overdraft to the Fed. Yeah. Sorry. So you go. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, just the key overdraft. thing from the point of view of uh, the public is if, if, if you just said, uh, yeah, the overdraft is, it's just a residual of government spending and taxing and we need to do whatever we need to do to have a good economy the public wouldn't think of it in the same way. But because they think of it as debt, that's where all the problems come in in Australia and the United States and the UK. So that's, my next, qu that's my next question. Since we have this modern understanding of um, how money works and you know how sovereign bonds work, can we just do away with them? I, I saw Stephanie Kelton uh, put out some tweets a few weeks ago. I, I don't know if I was reading it out of context, but she said tomorrow we can just do away um, with uh, government bonds. And my question is, could one country do that uh, while other nations don't? And how would that affect the, the valuation of their currency? Um, I'm in favor of its uh, convoluted system myself. I just say, let the TGA go into overdraft and be done with it. Um, can can we eliminate the need for so uh, like government bonds, Clint? Well, it's a little different with the U.S. Um, this is where key currency theory comes into play. Williams came to key currency theory, which turned out basically it's the system we're on. After Bretton Woods, um, we had the the system up until 71, basically into the early 70s. But uh, what ended up happening is what Williams in the 1940s said would happen with key currency. And this has to do kind of a Pareto kind of uh, effect. You're going to always have one dominant currency. And it's going to have effects on the rest of the world that are different than all the other currencies. Um, so what happens with the U.S. dollar is different. But yes, uh, I mean, as Moser always says, you could pay off the debt tomorrow just by changing the column at the New York Fed. It would just be saying, hey, guys, you don't hold bonds anymore. You hold reserves. It would change mm -hmm. nothing. And the argument yeah. by finance people that have their so in the woods, they can't see the trees or or something, or so in the trees, they can't see the woods. They think that they need bonds to set like the uh, rates and things like this, which is really weird because they're all free market guys. You'd think that they would be happy for the free market to figure out lending rates, but they think they need like a base uh, thing as a, um, like a benchmark setting tool, um, which is weird. They think the government needs to do that. Um, but yeah, yeah, bonds serve no purpose. I mean, China has, for example, everyone always talks about China. China has lots of dollars, which they end up turning into bonds, because they buy, uh, they uh, sell a lot of stuff to us. So yeah, they end up with dollars. Oh, and is he frozen? Oh well, Steve, your thoughts on you know the usefulness of government bonds in this day and age? Well, I, I think they're dangerous uh, when you've got a, a, a central bank that thinks it can manage the economy by changing. The interest rate because since you have bonds having a a, a face value and a face yield uh as you put the rates up you devalue the face yield 
and therefore what's supposed to be a safe asset. It's the whole idea of government bonds in neoclassical economic theory is that they're a safe asset. But they're not safe if the government can change their value by putting up interest rates. Um, so we'd be better off if we had um, if, if we had bonds which basically paid the going interest rate. That'd be like that would be. But if, when I have modeled the idea of the government not selling bonds, Clint, one outcome I get is that the uh, therefore the central the central bank has liabilities but effectively no assets because if the central bank can't buy bonds off the, either the private bank or the treasury then it only has a liability side, it doesn't have an asset side. Now, it doesn't matter that the central bank is a negative equity. In fact, it, it is not a common bank. It, it can actually handle that. But when you have bond sales, one little thing I do is just as a rule of thumb is to say that I assume that in the, the aggregate of open market operations that the central bank does with the private banks, it buys bonds equivalent to the bonds that were issued to cover interests on existing bonds. And then that therefore means that they they have an asset side. Um, but what it also means in terms of the mechanics of um, of uh, assets and liabilities of the central bank is that the central bank remains a constant equity. Let's say let's say zero equity. That's quite okay for them to have zero equity. Um, so it's paying interest on government bonds, which drives the central bank at a negative equity, unless the central bank can buy bonds. Or some other asset off the off the, either the private banks or the treasury, and the, off the private banks it's indirect, off the treasury it's direct. Mike, uh, your thoughts on you know the usefulness of government bonds? Yeah, I don't I don't have a strong opinion. I haven't studied or thought deeply about this issue. I I do. What's leaping to mind here in this conversation too is the idea of. Uh, the, the issuance of new bonds versus the trading, the buying and selling of existing bonds, right? And that kind of muddies the water for me as well, right? So I, I but I haven't really thought deeply about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm more listening than offering an opinion here on this particular issue. Well, there's an interesting point Warren Mosler has made, which is to say that because um, government interest payments are a, a stimulus for the finance sector, then he's saying increasing rates being a positive for the finance sector, but that's only true for new bonds. It's not true for existing bonds. So I think that there's, there's, again, there's all sorts of nuances and complications that are caused by bonds having face yields and uh, and face values. It, it'd be easier. If we simply said bonds are issued and the bonds pay whatever the going rate is. And that will also have a nice side effect of getting rid of the bond market, which would be a great idea. Clint, final thoughts? Yeah, it, uh, I mean, when, when I talk about the complexity, it's just such a, I mean, look at the finance press. Can you guys hear me? Sorry, I'm a little bit frustrated. I can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, just imagine all the uh, extremely smart people in finance and at the Fed and everywhere else, if they actually looked at production. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that uh, free marketers always argue for supply and demand, and yet if we're going to... Uh, keep the price level stable the way to do that increasing material well-being is by increasing supply right not not trying to tamp down demand it makes no sense i mean if you're if you're at home and you're hungry you don't say well i'm just gonna you know try to suffer my hunger more you figure out a way to get some food i mean really at the end of the day it's real resources and that's what the smart people should be working at and uh yeah the whole entire bond infrastructure is just a massive waste of time it's vestigial and we live in interesting times because in 1971 we uh, started truly having modern money and we're still in the process of getting rid of the vestigial um, early modern uh belief that bonds are necessary for modern states mm. nice uh clint let's uh we did this in the first first go around in part one we're in part three now uh, let's talk about your book, you know, um, just to remind people, and we've got lots of new viewers as the show shows growing since you were first on. Um, let's talk about your book. What what made you, you know, come up with the idea, the title of it, the content? What was the genesis of that process? The real basic idea was simply the idea of looking 
money, I hate the term money usually. I, I always say use say specifically what you mean. Do you mean reserves? Do you mean bonds? Do you mean coins? Do you what what cash? What do you mean? But um, money in general is for organizing things. And public money, when we impose a liability on ourselves and create a tax tax credit system, is to organize public goods. So um, you know, obviously historically it's been the military and all the bureaucracy related to that. Um, we've realized we can use that power for good, building bridges, um, uh, well, whatever can increase, uh, you know, public good. And there's various reasons why certain things make more sense as a public good. Um, and then you do have the credit system that generally funds private or non-government activity that ideally is productive. So, um, profit seeking organizations, once again, organizations, it's all about organizing, um, do things in search of profit that, you know, this is the free market idea that create more goods and services. And between the two of those, if you optimize both of those, you can get the, the greatest amount of, you know, the, the right balance of you know, a good level of public goods, but with a high level of material well-being as well. So basically that's the vertical and horizontal systems. And um, so that's the entire structure of the book. And it, the lead up to the very end, though, I should have spent more time on was precisely the idea that the last step that we need to take is getting rid of bonds because it adds so much complexity that the public thinks we're in debt and um, smart people are wasting entire careers on something that is completely vestigial and not useful. Why did you, uh, where did the title for the book come from? What uh, Thousand Castaways, Fundamentals of Economics. Where did you get that from? So the thousand castaways was because one, there's the old traditional is often in a lot of Austrian economics, but in Aust economics in general, the one person on an island or, you know, two people on an island. And the idea is that so many of the processes that are important to modern economies is, uh, like I said, organization. So it's emergent properties. So in the productive side, a lot of it's emergent properties. And then also on the public side, it's public goods. So I made it be a thousand people get stranded on an island. I imagine like a fleet of ships or something to simulate the emergent properties and the need for public goods and the organization when you can't just have like 10 people and talk about, you know, things face to face. So our monetary system is a way to organize activities, public and private. And so that's why a thousand castaways. And the I started to call it principles of economics or something like that. It's a, kind of a jab at like Mancu or any of those books. Um, I really think that Econ 101 should be start banking system and public monetary system. That should be the fundamentals of economics. Like when you go into Econ 101 and 102 in the U.S. And uh, they they do a sleight of hand. Um, uh, Steve Keen has written you know, wonderfully about this by starting with supply and demand sounds very great. You know, it's definitely an important concept, but by starting with that, you trick undergraduates into thinking little by little by the time they're graduate students that everything is in, in within a Marshall and Marshall cross, you know, a supply and demand, you get rid of everything that the free marketers don't want you to know about in a way. So, um, yeah, so the, the fundamentals of economics is a little bit of a jab at those macro textbooks. Uh, Steve, uh, this is this is the point in time Man Q has come up where you you kind of open up the floodgates here and give your two cents. Well, I mean, it's all it's all myth. This is what I find so frustrating. They don't even know their own history. I mean, it'd be hard to find any intellectual school of thought which is as ignorant about everything, including itself, as neoclassical economics. And uh, if you read Mankiw, for example, pardon me in talking about a demand curve, it, it's childish as well. He has an example of a demand curve for ice cream cones. And horizontally, Andrew, that Paul wants to buy four and Sherry wants to buy seven, but therefore the demand is 11. Oh, my God. I mean, you compare it to an engineering textbook, and it, it is... It doesn't belong at a university. It doesn't even belong in primary school, uh, the way they teach those damn books. And all the examples are made up. I mean, what has he got? Um, Hungry Helen's um, something rather shop. The Thirsty Thelma's. What a load of shit. I mean, it's all childish, bloody examples for a fictional world where none of the fictions actually exist in the real world. So there's my trashing of Mancure again. 
Yeah, it's incredible. I'll give, the, um... credit for one, I'll give credit for one thing. He did a very good analysis of why the Cobb Douglas production function doesn't fit international data. That was very well done. And I wish he'd stuck at that and not written his textbook. Mike, uh, yes, go ahead, Mike. So, yeah, just to, to leap in. Um, I've said in the past on this on this live stream that from a complex systems point of view, there's kind of two reasons that we get locked into bad situations. You know, we, we have a war on poverty since the mid 1960s. We still have poverty. Well, why is this this sort of thing? Either from a negative feedback loop perspective, you have policy resistance. The policymakers yank the system this way, but their goals aren't aligned with everybody else, and they pull the system back that way. Or with positive loops, you have path-dependent processes. So you get locked into inferior technologies. And I think economics textbook textbooks are an example of path dependency. We're locked into an inferior technology. So, for example, some years ago, a textbook rep came by and they, you know, they're always trying to have you adopt their text. And I said, no, no, I'm doing my own thing. Uh, so I don't need to look at your text. And then this guy said, well, I'm what we're, we're instructed if any professor has some innovative ideas to bring, you know, bring it to the editors. So I said, well, here's what I'm doing. And I was doing system economics with system dynamics. So a month or so passes and I get a letter from the editor saying, this is the most innovative thing I've ever seen in my life economics. There is no way we would ever ask you to write a textbook using this stuff because we wouldn't sell any books that, you know, everybody across the country who teaches economics expects the standard story. Mm -hmm. And they would, we'd lay your book on their desk. They have no idea what's going on. Dave Colander, very well-known, um, economist and econ textbook person. And I know, Steve, you know, Dave, I, uh, Clint, I don't know if you met. I have, but, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. He always would say there's a 15% rule. And that is you can be innovative in your economics textbook by 15%. 85% has to be the standard stuff or they won't publish it because everybody expects this installed base of econ professors across the country or the world for that matter who know, have been taught and have been teaching the standard story, mm. the neoclassical story, and yet they won't, they won't deviate from it. It's yeah. locked in. And I, 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 Dave, I actually saw, I've met Dave a couple of times, and I, we were, he, I was in the audience, he was on the panel, for a session on the 50th anniversary of John Muth's paper that gave us rational expectations. And I, 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 think, I think Sargent was one of the others there. You know, people of that you know, calibre, anyway, calibre in inverted commas. And Dave was quite clearly emotionally intimidated by them. He was trying to make critical comments about it and he was shut down and he basically moused back a bit. You can imagine what I did and said. Um, so yeah, it, it is really a case of intimidation. And of course, the idea of 15% applies, well, you know, this text is gonna be 15% deviant, so it's 1.15 and the next is gonna be 1.15 squared, so 1.325, et cetera. No, 85% is the reference point. They will not let you get rid of that core, it always goes back to Marshall. So he's 15% different to Marshall and will always be 15% different to Marshall. He'll never bring in the stuff that you and I do, any of us do. Yeah. yeah, so probably the leverage point, again, we've said this before in this broadcast, the leverage point is probably not, you know, Econ 101 at major universities. It's probably writing for the general public, writing for the business community, using these sorts of venues that we're doing now to get the word out because the other, you know, the other routes, the traditional route is, is, is locked yeah. in. They are. Yeah. So if you're watching on YouTube, um, hit that like button, subscribe to the prof Steve Keen channel. I see people watching on Twitter. I don't really track that feed very much, but there seems to be, a steady number of people on there between 10 and 20, which is usually they just kind of watch for a second and come over here. But if you're staying there, make sure you hit the like button there, repost. Um, but I do encourage you to come over here because we can get you in the chat feed if you have any questions. I've got Clint, you've already done this twice before. You know it's time. I've got to put you on the spot. You've got to read a lot of names. The list is growing. The names have gotten harder. Are you ready? 
All right, I can't yell it out. It's uh, four in the morning, but I'll. Uh, That's you can I'll, you you can I'll do it in your do a sm- yeah do a smooth radio voice then. Here it All is. Right. Top chatters comment oh, from I'm last week. Blocked. I can't see. I've got Jeff Mars. And- yeah, Mars. Lars is the first one. Sorry, I okay, should move Lars, that. AJV, Random 647, Wayne McMillan, the Libertarian, Brad Atherton, the Atheist Paladin, Oive, Alex Plante, our plant, J, J, J Bay, 088, Peter McGilver, McGilvery, Jay Daglish, Ghost on the Half Shell, Tony Wilson, TR, Data Lord, De La Terra, WWE Fan 0104, Stephen Hinton, Teddy Bruschi, Jen Srenberg, Bob Leori, Andrew Sullivan. Oh, yeah, we had this one before. Tomas Surdesh, Surde? I don't know. We got that last uh. time. <laughs> Wada Gushu, Michael de Sousa Cruz. Good to see you, Michael. Manorian, uh, Algorithm, Apple Scab, Bobby Valentine, Dre Guy, Bivic, Bivic. Shishir Pandey, Philippe Burns, Slug US Rex, Paul Luther Blissett, Olivia Langarica, Douglas MMT Macro Trader, The Minstrel 55, Andrew Sullivan, and Giacca Venendo. Oh. Speaking of textbooks, real quick, I wanted to ask Steve what he's working on now at the universities at now. Yeah, uh, thanks, Glenn. I'm actually m- m- the condition of employment is that I write one one book, thirty thousand words, and two effective blog posts, which is a pretty good deal. And so, what I'm writing is a book I'm calling uh, "Rebuilding Economics from the Top Down," which is stealing a line from another good friend of ours. Um, uh, and I'm suddenly frozen for name, another Canadian. Pardon me. Oh, God Almighty. Um, uh, Brian Romanchuk. Uh, uh, using, sorry? Uh, that Brian Romanchuk popped into my head as a Canadian. Yeah. I don't know who. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, so the idea is we don't need micro, and the micro they do is wrong anyway. So you can't have micro foundations for macroeconomics. That's both coming out of complexity theory, uh, so where the, the, the paper. Yeah, do you, do you know the paper by Philip Anderson? More is different. Mm, rings a bell, but uh, refresh us. I'm it's worth reading. Of... It's worth reading. Yeah, it, it's worth reading. Philip Anderson is a is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, or so a genuine Nobel Prize, and oh, he was okay, involved yeah. in some fundamental quantum particle physics, and then got involved in a battle over whether you could derive all of the rest of knowledge from physics. And there's a I've forgotten the, the guy who was pushing the other case saying. Uh, everything else is stamp collecting. Not 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 Rutherford who actually said that, but a modern physicist who was saying we should reduce chemistry to physics and et cetera, et cetera. And Anderson was making the case that a combination of complex nonlinear interactions and large scale means you cannot derive a higher level of analysis from a lower level. So he called what neoclassical economists do, which is trying to build micro, use micro to build macro, constructionism. And he said, Reductionism makes sense. You can take a complex system, break it down into parts. That doesn't mean you can start from the parts and build the complex system. So we have the fallacy of constructionism in neoclassical economics. Pardon, I've got a big truck going past outside. Um, so I then use that as my foundation and then also show work from complex systems analysis, which uh, is where you get like Lorenz's model of, um, of fluid dynamics. You only get c- complex interactions out of three or more dimensional systems. So once you have three dimensions, and Lorenz's model just had three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, and three variables, three parameters, A, B, and C, and you get an incredibly complex pattern coming out of that. But if you break it down to two of those, you lose the complexity completely. So reductionism doesn't work, even with a three equation system when there are nonlinear interactions between the different components of the system. So that's a, l- a large part of the book. And then I get into, I have a bit of fun, by the way, Clint, you'd appreciate this. Um, the idea that firms face rising marginal cost is a neoclassical assumption of diminishing marginal productivity, which in real firms doesn't apply. They all have excess capacity. They are they're designed by engineers rather than economists, thank God. So the factories get more efficient, but they're closer to capacity. 
So what that means is you have an average fixed cost. Yeah, you have declining average total cost and constant variable cost. So I, that's been something I've known for decades, and you'll, you can find that back in Andrews back in the 1940s. Well, you get it. This gets but into geography occurred. as well. Uh, agglomeration Sorry? effects from increasing returns industries. Yeah, agglomeration yeah, you know, effects from increasing returns industries. You, you, you well. don't really need it. You can, all you need is the basic rule that applies in most markets today of non price competition. So you have firms that are competing against each other, not on price, but on product differentiation. And then if you're a mature industry, an extra sale by you is one less sale by one of your competitors. So you can have a horizontal demand curve for the individual firm. So price is constant. You have a horizontal variable cost curve because variable cost is either constant or falling. So the gap between price and, and variable cost is always positive and may even grow with volume. And that means you do the mathematics, the differentiation, marginal revenue always exceeds marginal cost. And therefore, the sensible thing for a firm to do is sell as many units as possible. So I've done the it's very simple mathematics to prove that. And then I'm going into showing how you can derive macro from macroeconomic definitions. So you can start from the definition of the employment rate and the definition of the wages share of GDP and derive Goodwin's cyclical growth model of the economy. You add in private debt, which gives you the financial system. You get Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And what I'm doing right now is adding the government sector to that. And then I'm going on to, of course, explain modern monetary theory and money creation. And I've also got to cover the role of energy and production, because that's one thing which um, economists, including their post-Keynesians, don't have consciously in their models, the role of energy and production. And what I realized about five years ago was that in, the, the simple um, little saying, labor without energy, energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. So energy is an essential input to both labor and capital to enable them to do work. And therefore you have, that therefore necessarily means you have waste as well. You can deplete resources, all this sort of stuff. So it's a foundation for ecological economics at the fundamental level. So that's, I've got to fit all that in 30,000 words. <laughs> easy, easy. It's interesting you brought energy yeah. back in. It goes back to Saudi and uh, Vaslav Smil and um, some of the other people have always been worried about the energy side of it. The real resources, once again, always comes back to real resources. Yeah. And, well, it uh, seems, it's, yeah. So, to Mike, yeah. Well, I was going to say, it, it seems to me what you're describing, Steve, with your latest book is what Keynes taught us in the general theory. And that is uh, the, the reason we have macroeconomics is the fallacy of composition, right? Yeah. That if you believe that what's true for a part of the system is true for the system as a whole, that's a logical fallacy. You know, yeah. if you're at a, at a sporting event and you can't see and you stand up, you can see better. But if everybody stands up, yeah. different result, right? You know, and then, of course, the uh, a paradox of thrift is what Keynes told us, right? Where if you save more or I save more, it's good for us. But if everybody saves more, you throw the economy into recession. So ergo, the macroeconomics as a standalone discipline exists, right? Mm. And the idea of macro, uh, 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 macro behavior from microstructure gets a little bit sketchy. You know, that, that yeah. it, it, we're more than just the sum of the behavior of our individual parts, right? And yeah. then that requires not only looking at the individual parts, but their interactions. Hence, you need a systems approach. This is yeah. mental sunshine what... debris. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's the other, I cover that as well. So the, the, they, the thing about neoclassicals, they don't even know that they've got their own logic wrong. So like the demand curve, um, and you can find this back in 1953 from Gorman. Have you ever read Gorman's um, Community Indifference Fields paper? Uh, I've read about it from you. <laughs> In 1953, this guy speculates about that we would actually find a community indifference field that is identical to an individual's indifference field. And that's, you know, difference curves can't cross and all that shit. Um, and he realized the only way he could do it would be if you assumed that everybody had identical preferences and all commodities were the same as well. He didn't put it quite that way, but he said it had parallel Engels curves for all consumers. And when you when you work out parallel, and, and you then have zero expenditure at, at zero income, then those they're all the one line. So the only way you can get the neoclassical position is if expenditure doesn't change with income, 
and the expenditure isn't changed by redistributing income. And in this paper, and I quote, he says at one point, the necessary conditions stated above seems intuitively plausible. It says in effect that an extra dollar of expenditure will be spent in an uh, extra unit of, of money of spending power will be spent in the same way, no matter to whom it is given. That's not intuitively plausible, it's intuitively crap. But that's what they're willing to assume to hang on to the idea that they can derive a demand curve. And then you read the, the textbooks and it's even more of a disaster. So I, I'm having a fair bit of fun in this book now that I, I've got the status I have these days. I'm um, blasting these guys for their ignorance and stupidity. So I'm trying to win as many friends think, as I can before I die. I do think part of the problem as well again, this path dependency thing is uh, back in the day when economics was developing as a as a modern scientific discipline, if we want to call it that, uh, the tools that the economists of that era had were, you know, a pencil and scratch paper, basically. So they mm. were confined to linear models, linear systems, right? Yeah. And they were very simple. And so you had to make these simplifying assumptions as Steve just described and linear systems you know, the supposition principle, you can't, the sum of the behavior of a linear system is the sum of the behavior of the parts, but they didn't have the capability, the tools, the computer, if you will, to handle nonlinear systems. But of course the real world is nonlinear. And as soon as you go nonlinear, you have chaos, you have all the sorts of complex system behavior that makes these systems super difficult to predict and understand, but the computer allows us to lift some of these restrictions from the scratch paper and pencil era mm, mm. and do more sophisticated realistic analysis. But again, people are stuck in their ways. Yeah, this is one right. of the reasons I think it's so important that we get rid of bonds. Yeah. They're good, they're because, of the, over. because of the complexity. Sorry, Mike, I don't know if you're, I'm getting a bit of delay here. Yeah, no, 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 please, please Clint. That's just honest. the, the yeah. entire, um, this is what I was bringing home with the recent headlines is it's just, you can read very smart people, tons of data at their fingertips, computer programs and everything. And not even just the diluted neoclassicals, but everybody. Um, you just, there's, there, there's no way people can understand the system with bonds, with that added layer of complexity that's completely superfluous. Yeah. No, I think that's a real problem. Yeah. I mean, that, that's that, that's a, the level of practicality and people's capacity to understand things. But that's something people actually want to understand. <laughs> and they still don't understand that. Whereas neoclassical don't want to understand that you can't work in equilibrium and don't want to understand that nonlinear right, right. relations mean things don't work. So what I find fascinating is the lengths to which they'll go to hang on to their beliefs. And if you look back at the Jevons and the Volras and Menger and Marshall and even Volras back at that stage, they were saying, we know we're using a simplifying assumption, which we hope our successors will be able to overthrow. We know that, the, I think I think Jevons yeah. at one stage says that the, the real nature of, of the economy is continuous change. If we wish to explain it, we would like to do it in dynamics, but it would be so difficult, silly not to do the easier version when the difficult one is so hard for us to do. And that was equally mean as a crutch, which we want to get rid of. But when you hit the 9th to 20th century, equilibrium became a desirable trait of the economy because we all know that capitalism is there as a welfare maximizing system, you know, and therefore to be wealth and maximizing, you've got to be in equilibrium. So it went from being a crutch to being a religion. Hmm. And I think that's that's where the major flaws came from. Because if you had if we had people behaving like meteorologists do, as soon as nonlinearity was shown to be a major factor in weather, they jumped into Lorenz's fundamental equations. But neoclassic, neoclassicals, every time they see something which threatens equilibrium thinking, they try to kill it. Yeah, and that's the, it was the marginalist revolution, really, where I see them really yeah. trying to get rid of money in the system. And with that served, mm. incidentally, served other other uh, constituencies as well. Um, yeah, but that, well, the that's bank, the really bank right them for it. But yeah, they uh, they weren't doing anything wrong. They were just doing what they could. They would they wouldn't believe it if they could see that that has been carried as long. Mm. Yeah, I do think uh, I do think part of the problem in economics as well is the idea that economics is a science, a la physics, 
um, rather than a profession like, let's say, medicine or law. And, you know, there, that there's these fundamental laws of the universe, like general relativity or something, or Newton's laws or something, and we've discovered them, and they're immutable and what have you, rather than we're a physician and there's a problem here. We're just trying to figure out what's going on. Well, this yeah, kind of we use, we have scientific tools, but it's a very different uh, perspective, I think. This is, gets back to um, some of the uh, biggest uh, kind of mainstream critics, like uh, Noah um, no, uh, no opinion. What's his name? Noah Smith and oh, Smith. Uh, yeah. some of these kind of guys and and people like Mankiw and all these people that they're, they're big uh, Krugman. They're always like, show us your model. Well, one, you've got Minsky, but the model for public spending is the government. It's all written down in books. The, the rules of the Federal Reserve, the rules of the Treasury. That's the model. It's the real world model. It's 100 percent accurate. You can just look at it. It's crazy. And that's that's why I like MMT. I mean, they're saying, look, this is this is this is where a lot of the LPE comes in as well, the law and political economy movement. Um, you know, that that's the model. It's how spending actually operationally happens. Peter Cooper stuff mm -hmm. as well. And it's crazy that they think their little stick figure models are more important than actual rules of how the Fed and Treasury interact. Well, look at them giving the Nobel Prize to Bloody Bernanke last year for his work on money. I mean, that. Uh, there have been pretty big insults into intelligence for Nobel Prizes in the past. They're giving it to Bernanke for that shitty work that he did back in the 90s and early 2000s. And then in 2014, we had the Bank of England coming out saying banks create money, which obviates the whole idea of loanable funds and all that nonsense. And they give the bloody Nobel Prize to him. So I've got a good mate back in Australia who's actually an expert in complex systems called Robert Marx. And he runs a little betting tab effectively on on who's going to win the Nobel Prize for economics. And I said, so far as I'm concerned, they can nominate Mickey Mouse. That'd be just... Well, we'll, done. we'll, we'll find out the day after tomorrow. I think Monday the Nobel comes out. Oh, God, yeah. What wanker will they give it to this time, I wonder? <laughs> I've seen some pressure to give it to an economic historian, so that would be potentially less terrible, depending on who it is. Yeah, yeah well, they, they occasionally do this when they feel under threat. The, um, yeah, I'd, I'd take the money though, WWE fan, whatever I'm going for. I'd definitely pick the right cash and run. I was, I was <laughs> going to say, I'd Steve's, have a lot of fun writing my speech. Steve's a, a great economic historian that can cover all angles of economics from every school. You should actually um, take that. Pro now, if they gave it to you though, after all these years of really shitting on it. Boy, oh boy, that would be it. Would be like if Stone, like when Stone Cold Steve Austin won the WWE Championship in nineteen ninety eight, and he was always just shitting on it, anyways, right? It, it, you would be like the Stone Cold Steve Austin of economics if oh, that, you won the Nobel Prize. The economics, the economics profession is like professional wrestling. <laughs> <Good model. laughs> yeah. and, Very entertaining. No, 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 professional professional wrestling is entertaining. <laughs> you could trace uh, the banking transactions to how the money got to your account and that would be your <laughs> right yeah oh exactly. yeah exactly. yeah <laughs> good uh, yeah <laughs> well, if you if you've ever read if you ever read hayek uh he's a nobel prize speech it's actually extremely good and he said he basically said it shouldn't isn't a science uh, and he made the mistake of saying complexity meant complicated, which is the only mistake he really made. Uh, complexity, as we know, means nonlinear interaction between a small number of system states. Um, but uh, I would love to be the, like he was, he bookended it by saying it shouldn't exist. And not the book ended it, so it should be abolished. But thanks for the money, guys. It won't happen, of course. This is all fantasy. This is almost almost more of a fantasy than a Mancu textbook. <laughs> <sighs> I'm just I'm just trying to picture, you know, if uh, Krugman asked me, show me the model, and I showed him one of my models, I think he'd fucking quit economics, which mm. would be a good yeah. thing. Or at Did least he actually, have, you actually had a, have you had any feedback from Krugman or not? Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, Krugman, I'm too. I'm small potatoes, right? I'm. He's too big for you me. Know, you know, he took me on back in 2000 and. Well, oh, I'm, I, yeah. I'm well aware. Actually, oh, yeah, there yeah. is a yeah. there there is a page actually of a remnant of the back and forth um, between you and he replied a few yeah. times and then stopped. Um, 
And I found it quite amusing. And I yeah, so did I. Yeah. He's not. He's not really truly a post Keynesian. Uh, oh, and fuck. I. He. he no, I think please. he. He, he's part of that new Keynesian, neo-Keynesian kind of crowd, I think, more than anything. Um, oh, yeah, he, he's not yeah. post-Keynesian. I mean, he's post in the sense after, but that's about it. <laughs> well, was it Scott Fulwaller, I believe? He had the uh, flashing neon light uh, article. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, which Actually, one is that? Sign. No. I'll let me try to find it here. I, I know Scott, but I don't know the the particular article. Yeah, it's about the Keen Krugman debate. It's genius. Krug, oh, here we go. No. They have a copy of it on. Uh, I'll throw it up here real quick. Okay. Okay. Um, if you ever read Scott Fulweiler, which I believe I, I love his work, I think he's one of the better, more useful writers out there on all these issues. Um, here we go. Putting the link in the comments here. <laughs> if you've never read this, um, I like. Up, I like. Please, it, it, Please put it up there. Yeah, I'm laughing at Brett's comment there. It's very good. Oh, I didn't see it yet. No. Let's see. What, what do we got here? Full from Brett. lifted a phrase out of one of Krugman's books about you might as well have a flashing neon sign in your back saying, I don't understand economics or something. Um, but he turned it around on him. It was really good. I just put the link there. New economics perspectives link. Did, has any, did anybody watch um, Krugman on uh, the Lex Friedman podcast? No, no, I I did. It was only an hour long, so I I I couldn't sit through three hours of him. And boy, it just Lex is a smart guy. He's definitely not a, an economist, but he 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 can ask smart questions, thought provoking questions. And some of the questions you just you saw it go over Krugman's head, head and he's got this shit eating grin on his face. Like, what am I going to say to this? It was oh. it was very very entertaining. Um, not as entertaining as your appearance, obviously, or at least not. A, actually, it was an entertaining for the fact it was Krugman talking about economics, but not very yeah. insightful like your appearance uh, with Lex. Yeah. yeah, but if anybody uh, looked that up, it is it is funny. WWE fan um, kind of mentioned that Krugman <laughs> look he gets sometimes in interviews. It's just, it's hilarious. Like it, the little broken kid inside of him. I, I, it's something else. <laughs> it's funny. Brett's comment there. The same thing happened to me actually with John Quiggin. Uh, you know who that is. Uh, Steve Keen. I know John. Yeah. 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 I tried to talk John, John, John's a good guy. Relatively. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. He wrote a good. He had a good title for a book called Zombie Economics. Would you remember that one? Which is yeah, I've weird. looked. Yeah, he did the other one. And uh, Opportunity Costs was his more recent one. Mm -hmm. I know I have a million more questions to ask you, Professor Keen, but I can't oh, oh, think of all oh, of them right now. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I am interested. Uh, how 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 is it coming along on the whole bit with modeling in the vertical component or government money aspect? You touched on that with your current oh, work. Right. That's that's come upon quite. In fact, Ty's done the best work there. So Ty's taken all my approaches to economics, the Minsky cycle, the role of government spending, energy, and so on, and included his own work on a pandemic into a, probably the most complex, certainly the most complex Minsky model ever invented. So uh, you know, I'll I'll doff my cap there to Ty and putting it all together. I, I, what I want to do actually while I'm here in Hungary is work with the central bank to start building a Minsky model of the Hungarian economy. And Ty, I've already put you on the line there, that I want to bring you over here to show them how to do Minsky modeling properly. Oh, so you may amazing. get dragged away from Van, you may get dragged away from Vancouver if I manage to pull that off. The mean Didn't streets some, are hungry. <laughs> Didn't in some Hi, early Keens. days with, uh, dealing with the MMT crowd, uh, Professor Keen, you were dealing with Neil Wilson to do some kind of making it all double entry yeah. Neil Neil is very um, useful in my early days of getting into the doing uh, Minsky modeling. Because to be honest, when I began building Minsky, I was using tables to enter uh, equations for monetary flows, but they weren't double, event, double entry. I wasn't aware of double entry at the time. So there is a famous uh, mmt -er who once described me as, and I quote, that clown who writes science fiction and doesn't understand double entry bookkeeping. And at the time I considered he was right about double entry bookkeeping. Um, but since then, I think I'm probably the 
the world's best at that. Not or Ty probably out that does me in putting the molds together, but in terms of understanding it, because of Minsky, building Minsky, I've learned double entry bookkeeping. And then Minsky enables you to do interlocking double entry tables in a way that no other program does, which means you can get the incredible complexity of monetary systems to make it obvious what it is. So all the stuff about bonds, for example, we we're talking about earlier, you can see all that out of uh, no names, no pack drill TR. Um, you can you can see all that stuff in in Minsky's tables and it explain the actual logic to you. So Ty, where can we you find your work? Yeah. Where can, you well, uh, so, yeah, so I at tykeens.com. Um, that's where I kind of am um, blogging. Now, the model that I'm building, I'm just giving it right now to the paid subscribers. But ultimately, when I have something that I think tells a story about capitalism and the, the, the evolution of it, that's when I'll, I'll publish something um, a little more accessible to uh, the masses. Um, I, I can actually uh clint i can send you the model and i've been i've been uh, documenting um building it so i can kind of send you some of the work via email so you can check it out um wwe fan 0104 sure we can do some news right now So the thing is, uh, Josh. Josh is a WWE fan. There, he uh, he watches everything Steve Keen. He watches everything Ty Keens and a few other places. So I always like to. Uh, here's the thing, Josh. Is I didn't actually prepare any news. I just I just played the clip there. But uh, maybe we can touch on it briefly. And I haven't watched anything about it. But Dan was saying apparently Israel has mm -hmm. declared war on Palestine. Um, uh, either any of you three kind of been watching that news? Can you kind of fill, yeah, I've seen it fill in the yeah, gaps for me? A, well, there was, um, yeah, just a large, uh, an unprecedentedly large uh, attack from Gaza into Israel that, you know, on a scale that hasn't been seen before. So it's going to get r really messy. Um, it's on such a scale that, you know, people are thinking Iran and Russia might be involved and, you know, it would obviously serve Russia's any kind of chaos right now would serve Russia. I don't know. I don't want to take any kind of sides in this kind of thing, but it's definitely a, yeah. a big deal. It's on the anniversary I, of the uh, 73 war. Which one? The, which, the Yom Kippur war? Or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I hadn't even realized that. So they actually, okay, so October 7, 1970. <laughs> Two, three, yeah. Was the seventy-three? So yeah, we're talking yeah. fifty years ago. Yeah, it's a fifty. Actually, oh shit, a brick! So they chose the date to commemorate the fiftieth anniversary of Yom Kippur. Yeah. Holy fuck! I hadn't even that hadn't occurred to me. My God. Okay. Yeah, and it's just so, the, the degree of organization and all to it. It's nothing like we've, we've seen in decades. Oh, so wow. it's not pretty good. I, I, I have not watched the news, right? I kind of, I stayed up late blogging to, to, to post a blog last night, went to bed around two, then got up around seven this morning and got ready for the, I haven't heard, seen anything about it. So I'll have to check this out after the show. Oh boy. Yeah, I, just I mean, saw that, the headline. I mean, what worries me is that, I mean, the, Israel's military, uh, even, even though they've clearly, their intelligence completely failed them on this front. The fact that it's the 50th anniversary, that is incredible. That you, you think if anybody was clever inside the intelligence, they would have thought of the possibility of some, you know, maybe they'll do something on this day, maybe we should check. So they're completely caught by surprise. 5,000 missiles uh, being bombed into Israel, incursions by Hamas activists. Um, what worries me is that, has anybody here been to Israel or the West Bank or the Gaza? I've been to, well, I've been to, I've been to two of the three and I've been five meters, five, 15 meters or 15, maybe I don't know, but a certain distance from Gaza. So I've been to the West Bank, I've been to Israel and I've seen where the Gaza is. And it's terrifying. The, the Italian military, if the Israeli military decide to put the full force of their weaponry against Gaza, they'll level it. 
and you know, the well, entire population you know, it's a possibility die. of other actors getting involved as well. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. It's, it can get really messy and obviously, you know, if Russia is involved, I, I don't know, like it seems to me that the chaos would, you know, serve, you know, and you have what just happened in nagorno karabakh in uh, Armenia. Uh, yeah. Azerbaijan. This is, this is, this is clearly something coming from the Palestinians themselves because the fact that nobody knew about it until it happened. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. At the at level of secrecy and, and the fact that 50th anniversary, I mean, that is incredible. So, to me, what I'm, I'm not so much worried about Russia because this attached Russia by surprise, just like I took the Israelis by surprise. I, the Americans obviously didn't know about it. So oh yeah, yeah. Something. I'm just talking about the, uh, the potential for just the, yeah. You know, I, I think the main the main thing is most likely uh, which uh, Arab countries decide to put an oil embargo on. That's that would be what I would think would be the first fallout for the rest of the rest of the world economy on uh, on this impact. And, um, and and like uh, there's no way I guess can't I can't imagine them defeating Israel. That is just uh, you know I, I, the military maybe not isn't what it was say you know 30 40 years ago, but it's still probably the third or fourth strongest military on the planet. So I can't see them winning the Palestinians. I can't see them winning this at all. It's a question of what retaliation Israel goes for. And if they've declared war, then you know. That pretty much means all bets are off. It's yeah. I mean, obviously, the most important, you know, immediate concern is the people involved in Gaza and all that. But um, yeah, obviously, people are bringing up the Saudi Arabian Israeli kind of thawing lately. You know, that's yeah. you know that the, the Javian, yeah, Javian's comment there is quite true. I think that's true. Uh, the Arabs have no allegiance to the Palestinians anymore. Um. But they'll lose. They'll, they'll they'll sort of be shamed into doing something, and that may well be an oil embargo. Uh, certainly, an oil embargo against Israel, um, and maybe against America. So, the, and again, Palestinians, Iran. I think that's quite correct. Um, so we could see Iran perhaps doing something. So, oh God. Yeah, somebody pointed out just just recently. Somebody pointed out just recently that I coined the phrase that the twenty twenties are the hold my beer decade. Uh, and you know, for Christ's sake, can you stop 2023? We know you're the shittiest year in history. Stop proving it. Bloody hell. Uh, sorry, I just I'll have I to do some help. reading on that tonight. I can't help but think about the limits to growth. Yeah, you know, it, again, it didn't, 50 years it, ago. It, it didn't say um, you know, what the social struggles would be per se because it was an aggregate model um mm. but i i can't help but to think we are seeing the beginning the very small beginnings of resource constraints and the the civil unrest that's going to cause year after year um i might be wrong but it's just it comes to mind you know thinking about the 2020s um you know and where this world is headed we, I've, we've got a follow up. You and I've got to have a chat, by the way, about that after the show, Ty, um, because I've seen some arguments that are worth us trying to model about whether we are facing a, a real confluence of resource constraints at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah, this, um, I was going to ask you, uh, usually when you discuss MMT or the banking system, often it's in a national kind of level, but uh, I, I see a fundamental kind of different dynamic with international aspects of and it kind of it ties into commodities and of course trade but the monetary system and of course Keynes bank or I mean where do you think we're headed with anything like that oh, Mike I'm gonna let you have a first pass of that one I'm still getting over the Israel and the 50th anniversary effect well I think uh, an idea that runs through Keynes's work, including the Bancor, is the idea of a buffer stock, right, to stabilize a system. And so in the international financial system, it seems to me one element that needs to be stabilized with whether it's a Tobin tax or, or what have you is the actions of speculators, right? Uh, you know, you need the currency, the, a, a currency for trade. That's a legitimate use, but trying to uh, uh, buy low, sell high a particular currency or short it or whatever is, 
is probably not good for um, the international monetary system. So, I mean, I would that's one place I would look. Uh, this new um, currency that's tried to be uh, established by, you know, Break. I know uh, I'm not, I don't have a good feel for where that's going yet. Um, but I think the nations of the world, unlike post-World War II, are kind of over. <laughs> the U.S. saying, you know, we won the war for you guys, we're in charge. Um, so, you know, other currencies or or um, cur you know, baskets of currencies that are going to be competing with the dollar are starting to sprout. Uh, where where that goes, not sure. Um, so I don't, I don't know. It's um, it's a good question though because you know with with globalization and with uh, the interconnectedness of the world getting bigger and more important every year obviously um currencies exchange rates and what have you are at at the forefront and obviously then that translates into the fiscal space that we have uh with um domestic policy you know and you get uh into the uh the impossible trilemma right pick two of the three you can uh, manage your exchange rate you can manage your interest rate or you can have capital moving in and out pick two of the three Right. And um, so the nations of the world are going to have to decide, right, in, in light of these, these sorts of issues, what they, what they want to do. I mean, China has a particular set of problems. And so they 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 pick what they want to do right in light of the people coming off of the, uh, the rural areas. Now they have a housing bubble and what have you. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, I don't have a, a very specific answer, but I think the general problem uh, is important, and uh, I mean, it cries out for modeling, I guess. And this relates uh, strongly to the yeah. hierarchy of currencies and this kind of literature, which is a major critique of MMT. I wonder if Professor Kane has worked or thought much on this issue. I'm sure you have, but yeah, but my I really haven't modeled the international trade thing. I mean, one, one thing I want to do is to take apart the one part of immature that I completely disagree with, with the arguments that they say that exports are a cost, imports are a benefit. Uh, and, and that comes no, down to, and I actually was reading Koleski on that today, by the way, and Koleski mm -hmm. talks about how an export surplus is effectively exactly the same thing as a government deficit in creating additional profit and more investment capability for the country running and ex uh, having more exports and imports. So I, I want to pull that apart at some point. But... My feeling in the practical world, what's going to happen is that, first of all, uh, we're getting to the point where energy availability in terms of actual free energy to use for production is starting to fall apart and globalization will come to an end um, with the impact of global warming. At some point, that will be the end of us using ships, uh, diesel powered ships to transfer stuff around the world. So I think we're going to fall back to a, to a, to a far less globalised and far less international trade-based system. And it's going to be back to regional productions in a, a form of autarky. Um, so I, I, I still think the international currency um, issues are interesting, but I don't think they're going to come to fruition fast enough. I think they're going to be beaten by a collapse in resource availability, more damage from global warming, and then any country which is going to survive is going to have to be much more autarkic and how it behaves. Yeah, I've, about, I've, my interest was long-term economic development originally, now, especially economic geography, which was my specialty. And the the heterodox theory that I think that MMT is missing is I've mentioned it here in the comments. Eric Reinert is especially good. Um, it's basically that MMT is just missing some of the uh, factors. It's not that they're wrong per se on this. It's just there's more to the story, and it has to do with uh, when you look at um the benefits of trade. A lot of it has to do with tacit knowledge and the ability to produce and all of these kind of things. And uh, they're just missing that. You've got to have some manufacturing in your country to be have the kind of economy you're going to want. What do you What do you guys think about uh, in terms of a resource crisis? Uh, fresh water as really the Achilles heel. Based on the half shells just raised that a moment ago, the Mississippi is drying up. So we, we, we really are, and particularly the Colorado River, the stresses on the Colorado River are enormous. Um, 
So it's quite possible we are we are running out of resources and not even resources we're running out of water, which of course is a replenishable resource. But you've got to you know get the salt out of it, and, and we don't have the energy to do that. Panama Canal. Um, so all these, we 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 are putting such a load on the planet that we're, a, and this is where limits to growth comes in so importantly. And as high as you said, they had a smooth because they had a set of, set of differential equations. They had to have a smooth uh, d decline as well as a smooth rise. But when this hits, we're going to have a catastrophic collapse, and we could be seeing it happening certainly this decade, if not this year. The tipping points. Yeah, shifting yeah. feedback loop dominance with a nonlinear system, you can get the abrupt, the abrupt changes. The reason I raised the question was that just this morning I read a Wall Street Journal article where um, they were arguing that Arizona does not have a water shortage crisis. And their argument oh, yeah. was that most of the water, like 70% of the water is used for agriculture in Arizona. And the land use is switching from agriculture to housing, residential land use, and that residences use way less water than farms. So there's no problem. And that the groundwater was stable. So different perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Michael's making some comments here on the MMT front. I, I find it ignorant because it's 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 doing everything in terms of a static. You gain this, you lose that, you come out ahead. Uh, what you also see is, of course, you invest. If you have a higher rate of investment coming out of an export surplus, you develop your technologies more effectively. And that's left out of the eye, that little quip, the you know, exports are a cost, imports are a benefit, whether you're talking monetary or real. And frankly, remember also when I had that fight with Mosler, he made he he trashed me on this, said the monetary stuff doesn't matter, which I think is a contradiction of the other half of MMT. Uh, you, what you get, if you have an export surplus, you reinvest it, you become technologically advanced compared to your importing rivals. And if I had to choose an economy that I wanted to be in, in terms of manufacturing capability now, uh, I'd choose China, not America. Yeah, you want to uh, mercantilism from the beginning is the way the English practice it sometimes on yeah, accident. Fundamentally mercantilism you want to correct. export yeah. high tech, I mean, and you want to import commodities. That's the winning yeah. formula. Yeah. You can't and do it the other way. That's what China's around. been doing. Yeah, that's right. China's been doing it successfully. America has been doing it the opposite. And, you know, Australia's going to have a too. Yeah, potentially, because it did, as you said, it's houses and holes. That's all the mystery has going for it. Yeah. It's yeah. just lucky because yeah. it has only 25 million people to, with all the benefits from a great deal of commodities. But yeah, I, I mean, disagree with most of unreal terms, Michael. Sorry, pardon me talking over you there, Clint. Oh, sorry. sorry. I disagree yeah. with unreal terms. Like his, his real analysis is static, and that's wrong. Anyway, sorry. Sorry, but sorry, Clint. No, 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 no I, I haven't. Delayed. It, it, sorry. Yeah, it's it's um, I, I completely agree with Steve. I look at it a, a dynamic way. Bottom line, if your country and aggregate is exporting something, your firms are earning a profit, your firms are going to invest a portion of that profit into its capital stock. That's going to boost both output and employment. It is the real benefit to the economy, not stuff you get. That's it's saying something is a real benefit because you have something is that is a consumptionist type narrative that is not based in reality moving forward on this planet considering well, like said, uh, the issues dynamic. we're going to have you can show this point very easily with the levy kletsky equation and in eighth grade algebra yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly you get a high rate of investment you're running an export surplus, you invest faster, you grow more rapidly, you have higher technological capability. And the only part of America that's holding up technologically is Tesla and SpaceX. And the rest of it <laughs> is going backwards. Yeah, it's tacit knowledge and uh, the actual ability. Somebody just wrote something about this. Where is this? I'm looking on. But um, yeah, uh, somebody posted on Twitter. This is good. I think ultimately with the free trade maximalist of the 90s and 2000s missed is that outsourcing so much manufacturing overseas saved money in the short term. But in the long term, we lost the natural skills development engine environment that is the factory floor. I saw that too, by the way, Clint. Who said that? It was very well put. Uh, a guy named Glenn. Yeah, somebody I didn't know. I reposted it. Uh, yeah. Co-founder. Yeah, just, just somebody. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very. I agree. I saw the same thing. thing. I thought it was very well put. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're missing all that kind of middle, high level, non university, just, you know, knowledge of how to make things. I mean, countries oh, not yeah. going to stay wealthy if they can't do that. 
Mm. And that's where the education happens on the shop floor. Absolutely. Yeah. So Clint, we, uh, we're at the, we're at the end of the two hours. My question is, was it comfortable for you to finally get to talk to Steve or was it a little more uncomfortable this time around? Because for me, for me, when I first, uh, you know, had a conversation with Steve, I, my, cause he's a bit of an intellectual hero for me. I was scared shitless. I still oh, I go back to, I, I go back to that video and I was stiff, stiff as fuck. Um, I felt this big compared to Steve. Um, and I'm just wondering, did you feel a little bit of that or were you nice and comfortable through the whole show? Well, I feel bad partly because of the delay. I know I've talked over a little bit something, but uh, no, I'm just great to finally uh, talk to the person who's inspired so many of us, really. Um, the, the early stuff from debt deflation and then unlearning economics. And these have been just blockbuster intellectual achievements that are real huge inspiration for all of us and have really propelled the field even if the mainstream doesn't realize it yet we're getting there so uh, it's just been i reckon we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll convert them after they manage to destroy capitalism not before um yeah that's why i was interested in what you're doing now at the the, the current yeah. i know you've been dealing with like, the north house and the climate stuff oh like, God almighty, like, yeah. with, like with great artists your work is only valued after you're dead <laughs> mm-hmm. so my descendants to get some cash out of that i don't mind i was actually thinking i was actually thinking what the just that for some reason galileo died not knowing that his vision would take over our knowledge of the yeah. universe because on his tombstone it says and yet it moves okay yeah, so yeah, yeah. You know, so he he did not realize that his contrarian but accurate position would take over humanity after his death. So the poor man went to his grave not knowing the impact he had upon our future development. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's been another great episode. Clint, we'll, uh, we'll have you back in a few months for sure. You're you're part of the Stephen Friends family forever now. Oh, you, yeah, hold the record for, you hold the record for the most yep. uh, appearances on the show, so we'll... We'll keep that going. You're you're that guy now, Clint, the record holder of appearances, <laughs> and also gonna... the person who's come on the most late, latest time in the day. So congratulations on staying up from three a.m. to five a.m. Yeah, that's, that's that's yeoman's work. No, no doubt. Well, like I said, I got real confused. You know, I came all the way to Australia to see Steve, and he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm here. You can find his book. Um, let me bring it up. Oh, I. Put it back down. A thousand castaways: the fundamentals of economics. Clint, I'm sure you can fi- you can find that on Amazon, right? That's where I get all oh, my yeah. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would change a few things now, but I need to do a follow up. I think. Uh, but yeah, the idea behind that was always just to get you know it's written at a level for graduating high schoolers or first year, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. university, just to get their idea of. Or, or in, in other words, 90% of the economists out there with the same <laughs> yeah. intellectual level. <laughs> yeah, no, there Anyways, works. that's it, guys, for Steve Keen, Mike Radzicki, and Clint Bullinger. We will see you next week. Bye bye.